And now, from the academic heights of Ryerson <laughs> University, <laughs> Sue Ann. I hate to use up any of my time because I know how mean Martin can be if he's crossed. <laughs> but I don't think I've seen so many familiar faces in an audience since my wedding. <laughs> how many people here worked for the CBC at some point in their lives? Oh my God. <laughs> how many are ashamed to admit they were? <laughs> Right. I will try to be brief. I agree with uh, some of the things that some of the other people have been saying. I think that the CBC's main challenge over the long run is going to be survival. So I'd like to address that and I'll go back to something specific at the end. But first, especially given this crowd of former CBCers, I have to reveal a guilty secret. Years ago, after I had left the Mother Corps, mm -hmm. I worked briefly, among other things, for an industrial psychologist who was doing research for what I will call another network on branding. I did mostly background stuff, but what I learned from his research, and I had access to all of it, is that branding for a non-specialty television channel resides largely in its news and information programming and above all simply in who anchors the main newscast. So people may love Dragon's Den or Bomb Girls or Let's Dance Canada, but many of them have to surf through the television changer to find out where it is on the dial. They know where their news show is. They know how to find the National or the Fifth Estate or Rick Mercer. So I think that the CBC would be wise to focus on those traditional areas of strength, news, current affairs, and satire which to my mind is an alternate form of news programming, no matter what the CRTC thinks about it. <laughs> I do not find a surfeit of good information programming elsewhere. I'm not saying that the CBC should produce no comedy, drama, or reality programming. It always has, and I hope it always will. But I don't think this is the time to look for those, to those areas for salvation. Drama in particular, as many of you know, is very high risk and CBC is at a particular disadvantage right now. Why now? Because the new regulations governing Canadian programming expenditure and programs of national interest mean that the privately owned networks are going to have to produce more Canadian programs. And the private networks, for all of their moaning, have an awful lot of money. Moreover, I think that they have learned a lesson in recent years. I think that successes like CTV's Canadian Idol and Corner Gas have showed them that Canadian programming does not have to be an also-ran. It can be useful for them if they produce high enough quality. When I was at the CBC, the programs I was with were obsessed with audiences. And we do need to keep them high if you're taking government money then the CBC has to have a lot of people watching, watching and listening to at least some of their shows. But at the same time, there's a reality I think we have to face. Audiences are never going to get bigger. They can only get smaller. Barring an attack from Mars, nobody's going to be getting double-digit numbers. There's just too much specialty programming around. I expect any day I will be able to turn on my TV and get my own dream channel, the all underwater, no sharks channel. <laughs> <laughs> so what I did, not to sound too negative, was to look at what I think would be an unquestioned CBC success. Rick Mercer, what does he offer that makes him successful, both in terms of bringing in numbers and <coughs> also in terms of being an example of what the CBC should be doing? He creates a sense of community. He highlights places that have achieved a sense of themselves. He finds those handful of Canadians that all of us recognize. He searches out things that we at least believe are distinctively ours, like ice fishing and curling, even for those of us who have never and will never try any such things. He at least tries to reflect Canada by focusing on the primary concerns of life, how we work and how we play. He tries to reflect the whole country. It is pretty obvious that not everybody can be left of center. Most Canadians may live in large cities, but not all. We do not all ride bikes and love gourmet food and urban music. I'm not saying, uh, <laughs> for the future, the more fully representative, the better. Next, when I watch, I learn things I didn't know, and that's very important to me. I'm not saying that every show should sound like ideas, 
But when I watch or listen to the CBC or look at the website above all, I gain new information all the time without having to work on it. And that wasn't, isn't just important to me. That was very important to my father, who was a furrier and then a travel agent who never made it past grade 11. That's why he liked the CBC. Finally, and I think this is really important, the show adds value and gives a real sense of participation online. I think the healthiest development in recent years has been the growth of the CBC's online division. I think it needs more resources, in particular for adding lo local and even micro-local coverage, especially for areas that are currently underserved. But it has to be online participation that's genuine, that's not just a kind of numbers game to get people to say that they like the show. And all of that might help with the biggest obstacle, which is governments don't like the CBC. Not just this one, which is ideologically uncomfortable with a public broadcaster, any future government is going to want to continue to reduce funding. They're just not, want to go, not going to want to pay for it. And that problem is compounded by the fact that the old CBC loyalist audience is fading away. Sure, it's nice to have big numbers. Knock yourselves out. But some of the people listening and watching had better belong to the fans of the Insiders panel on the National and the House on CBC Radio, because those are the people who write to their MPs, keep up the pressure, and fight for the CBC. Thank you, Sue Ann. Very good. Okay, I'm going to address a few questions to our panelists before we uh, go to the floor for questions. Um, Linda and I was just wondering, in your, uh, in your years at the Fifth Estate, um, what have you learned about um, loyal audiences and um, identification of um, people who watch the show with the CBC as opposed to... It seems to me that uh, uh, in the case of many shows, uh, the more similar they are uh, between one network and another, uh, that people may not even be aware uh, which network they saw it on. Uh, whereas I would guess that the Fifth Estate has a very high proportion of people know, knowing where it comes from. But um, how have you seen that evolve or change over the years? The show has uh, stayed alive <clears throat> by evolving over the years. Uh, it's quite a different show than it was in 1975 when it started. Um, we follow audience uh, preferences and trends, uh, but not slavishly, otherwise we would be doing a lot of song and dance. <laughs> uh, we, but we do deliver, I think, a, a solid journalistic product because uh, a solid journalistic product, whether or not it is considered to be um, popular or uh, something that people are going to uh, uh, want to have, you know, it, it's kind of like the, the main course of dinner. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we, we try to do that, and every so often we'll, we'll throw some, something light in uh, to sort of get, really get popular. But, by and large, uh, we, we have managed to uh, walk a, a fairly tight rope uh, down the middle of human interest, serious investigative journalism, uh, heavy analysis, and, and uh, you know, critical political commentary. It's all sort of mixed up so that people, when they tune in, they don't really know what they're going to get. There are two things I wonder uh, about with the show. One is, uh, in Richard's book, uh, there's an anecdote about when you moved it. F uh, Brought the, it. The, yeah. Uh, and uh, you said that Lyndon was very un unhappy about that. No, no, I was quoting somebody else who no, I no, think no, was talking to No, 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 you got me in there, oh, too. Yeah. yeah, but I don't know whether I was quoting you. I was quoting the walrus well, quoting you, I think. What Anyhow, did, the okay, point well, is, okay, yeah. Anyway, what difference did it, I mean, first of all, well, how we did were, you feel we were, about that? I mean, we, the, 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 there's a very long story. We could do an entire <laughs> discussion on that about why uh, we got upset. We had, we had a particularly uh, important program on a Wednesday night, and we find out, like, Friday night that we're not going to be on that night. And anyway, Friday night is not exactly prime current affairs audience night. People who are sitting home Friday night looking at TV aren't looking for something that's going to make them feel bad or smarter. <laughs> I'm always looking for something that's going to make me feel bad. Anyway. <laughs> 
But the, but the problem with the move, and, and Richard, and, I, and I want, I'm going to take this opportunity in front of everybody because people are going to go down there and buy your book. Quite right, too. And I want to warn them that Richard manufactured a quote and stuck it in my mouth oh. in his book, and uh, it's not true. Oh, good. Okay. And, uh, okay, so uh, page 96. <laughs> <laughs> And, and there's one I'll other find the book for you, and I'll find page 96. But there 96. is a more famous incident in which Richard... But just before we leave the movement of the Fifth Estate, here's, I just got to make a little point. So why did we move the Fifth Estate? Uh, the Fifth Estate is, was on Wednesday nights. Wednesday night is like killer's row. Uh, it's like got one of the most... The two, probably the three most difficult nights of the week are Sunday, Wednesday, and Thursday nights. Uh, because that's when the top U.S. shows are all put on. The level of competition is tremendous. So when we moved the Fifth Estate, we wanted to move it to a place where we thought the level of competition against it would be less, and therefore it would be likely to get more viewers. And that's exactly what happened. The number of yeah. viewers, the viewership went up very substantially from the very first night that we moved it. So that was the reason. It was not to try to damage the show. It was, in fact, to try to strengthen the show, and oh, yeah, it actually worked. <clears throat> when we moved, we were very upset about moving away. No, I know, I know. But And Slavko Klimkiu made a special trip to my office to say, you are the only serious CBC production that we can put on at 9 o'clock Wednesday night and survive the American invasion. Okay, so that's why we no. were there. And we did well for years and years. But the... But, but you did better on Friday night. Well, not not consistently. Yeah, pretty not consistently, consi Linda. Consistent. I mean, yeah. Hey, but yeah, yeah, I, you're, yeah. Di you're digressing. Please stop bickering. <laughs> the, the point is, uh, to answer Martin's question, there was one other incident which we, which we uh, we now it's now cultural part of the cultural history of the CBC, which is the, the fisticuffs. Fisticuffs, yeah, yeah. Fisticuffs. Yeah. It's uh, Gillian Finley and Neil Doherty. Mm. Now again. Uh, the, one of the problems is, is that when we're, we're reviewing history, sometimes things get taken out of context. And the movement of the Fifth Estate to Friday night was controversial. Also, the fact that in, in three years under uh, your uh, management, we lost 25% of our budget. So this, was, this didn't sort of go to a whole lot of good relationships. But <laughs> where, where did the fisticuffs come in? Fisticuffs came in one, one afternoon. Richard decided to do the, you know, the, the, the smart management thing. He had everybody in the big room and said, here's what we're doing and here's why we're doing it. And somebody from the, Na a producer from the National gets up and says, uh, really, it's, uh, it's hard what you're doing to the fifth estate and, to, and to, the, to information programming in general. And Richard gave an answer and the answer got a little bit feisty. And then a couple of people from the fifth estate got up and challenged your answer. And, uh, and it got increasingly feisty. But it was, it, was a broad, it was a broad discussion of the essence of what you're all about and your book is about and what is a very legitimate debate, what CBC should be doing, whether emphasis on entertainment, whether the cute kids should get the shoes or the smart kids should get the shoes. Well, this is an one a... shoe each, I don't no. know. <laughs> but, but anyway, the, the, the bottom line is that it's a firm that if you're reading Richard's book, which is a very good and interesting and lively, stimulating, smart book, but if you're reading it, Take what I said with a grain of salt because I didn't say it, <laughs> and take the fisticuffs incident with a grain of salt because it didn't happen that way. Yeah. Oh. Okay. But we can agree that Richard's period at the CBC was not boring. Richard's period at the CBC was definitely not boring. Can I just make one little comment about all this? Is that all right? Do I have a moment? You, you've made a few. Go ahead. Well, um, first of all, I think I know th the news department of the CBC is an important department. Of that, there can be no doubt. But it's not unique to the CBC. I would say the Fifth Estate was unique. I would say Marketplace was new, unique, but not the news department, per se. Not just straight up news. The, you can get news lots of places. I can go to CTV, I can go to Global, I can go to City, I can go to newspapers, I can go to websites, all over the place. I can get lots of news. We ain't short of news. Not Canadian news in our country we are not short of it. Mm. The truth is that that in 2004, when I arrived at the CBC, the news department, if you compared how, much, how many Canadians were watching the CBC news compared to those who were watching Global and CTV news, it was, get ready, 12%. It took 12%. The other 88% of viewers were sitting over at Global and CTV. The local news properties had collapsed utterly. 
The, the, even the national was running third in its time slot. You could make the numbers better by adding them all up in terms of going on News World. And News World itself was typically being beaten inside Canada by CNN, a foreign news organization. Now, this is embarrassing, and this won't do. So, it's, but we, so what we did do was we put enormous amount of attention and priority on rebuilding the news. We rebuilt all of the supper hour shows, okay. and I must say, we increased the amount of time on the network for news. There's okay. more time for news. I want to go to another question. Okay. So just, can, but can just I, to finish the thought. Can I just, just to finish the context. thought. Just to finish the thought. You can't, the, you, you know, what happened was that the local shows are now two or three times larger than they were before. The news network is completely dominant. It does not get beaten by foreign news networks anymore. And in fact, the national's numbers have improved very significantly. So CBC and News is stronger. This is where is I get stronger. lost, Richard. This is where I get lost. You had a huge study that told you, mm -hmm. and it's in your book, yes. that, that the Canadian uh, fans of the CBC wanted uh, more news, more foreign, more investigative, more analytical, more depth. You had that. And you, and you believed it. And then you turn to an American consultant who tells you, some, for some reason or other, that Canadians want more traffic, more potholes, more crime, more security, well, what they said, more anxiety. Don't forget weather. And that is what, that's not okay. what they took over the culture. The okay, news. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn the, yes, they have to have turn a the discussion else. Okay. We'll correct their errors okay. Okay. <laughs> after we're finished correcting our own. Okay, yeah. Sounds like uh, you guys could go on correcting each other's errors for some weeks to come. So, uh, <laughs> Sue Ann, um, I want to put this question to you because we've had uh, a lot of reference to, uh, to ratings, but I think we've kind of maybe skirted the main issue here. So, here's the question. Um, you know, certainly according to Richard's book, it's, it's all about ratings. It's eyeballs, eyeballs, eyeballs. And uh, so the question is, to what end? And uh, if, uh, in the course of getting ratings, the public broadcaster becomes very similar to lots of other private broadcasters, um, then what have we lost? And why should, why should the private networks accept competition from a, someone who has the unfair advantage of being, uh, getting government subsidy? And why should the public want to pay for it if it is similar to what they're getting in private television? Actually, I think you just put your thumb on the scale a little bit on that one. That okay. that's sort of a loaded question. Mm -hmm. So public is paying for a lot of it. So some of the shows need to be really popular. Why would the bulk of the population go on paying for programs that don't appeal to them? And some of the traditional sources, such as hockey, are apt to go away. So the CBC is going to have to find other shows that lots and lots of people watch. But it certainly can't be enough for all of the reasons that Martin mentioned, that if it, is, if it is simply shows that bring in large ratings and that are not that different from shows that are being produced elsewhere, and they will be produced elsewhere, then you're not going to have a justification for continuing the existence. There is a Broadcast Act, no matter how difficult it is and how self-contradictory its terms are, the CBC has to do more than that. And some of its best and most characteristic programs do not bring in huge numbers. You can't get something like Writers & Co. anywhere else in the Canadian spectrum. And I disagree on the idea that there's lots of news in Canada. There's lots, but it's not very good by and large. I think that international coverage is just dreadful at the moment. It is hard to get in-depth coverage. and. I'd like to see not the kind of old Ottawa agenda-driven CBC News that, that I worked under, where there, there was far too much of that, the Meech Lake Moonies going on and on and on about how to sell this to the Canadian public, but actually letting us learn about the country, finding out what's going on elsewhere, which I think CBC is doing a pretty good job with right now. Okay.